Hi folks, welcome back to Physics with Captain Rod. I'm making this video to introduce you to the concept of uh, induced voltage or induced EMF, which I've put in quotations here with a little frowny face because if you have me in class, you know I, I do not care for the term EMF and most physicists don't. Um, you know, EMF stands for electromotive force. And again, uh, EMF is basically a voltage. It's a, um, which, makes it have units of volts or joule per coulomb. It's not a force at all. It's just that when you have EMF, that tends to uh, produce currents and make charge uh, move. So I'll explain a little bit about what we're looking at here. Um, this gray material is going to be conducting material in this example. And this kind of darker gray material is also conducting. And they are in electrical contact here and here. However, for the sake of this example, we are going to assume that this vertical bar can move right or left. All right. In purple here, we're going to imagine there's a background uh, magnetic field. has some magnitude. It's in the minus k direction as defined by this uh, coordinate system. I call these zatchas here, uh, x, y, and z atcha. And what we're going to do is we're going to imagine this bar moving to the right, and we're going to kind of... Uh, conceptually um, figure out what that does to the bar. What type of behavior are we going to see? So imagine this bar is moving to the right. I'm going to put a velocity vector on it. And I'm just picking a direction. It doesn't matter if it's right or left for the video. So the velocity vector might point this way. And if we think about this conductor moving through this magnetic field, remember that the conductor has all kinds of charge free to move in it. And we're going to kind of investigate one charge carrier here. I'm just going to pick a plus here. Uh, I'm imagining a single charge carrier in that conducting material. The velocity of that charge carrier would also be to the right. So it's going to experience uh, a force, a magnetic force. Whoops. And remember that the magnetic force on a charge carrier is QV cross B. The velocity vector is to the right in the plus I direction. So when we do the QV cross B, your fingers would go in the direction of the velocity. You'd rotate so you can sweep towards the magnetic field vector. And what you should conclude on this is that the magnetic force on this conductor is up. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a force vector here. Now, it's kind of difficult to show a right-hand rule based on uh, uh, this computer screen, but if you're, if you're not coming up with the, uh, that force direction, just go back and review my video on uh, right-hand rule for magnetic forces. Very important to realize, not just this one, but every single charged carrier in this conducting material, if it's positively charged, it'll feel a force upward. Negatively charged would feel a force downward. Some of these charged carriers, remember, are free to move, specifically the outer shell electrons. So in reality, what would happen is outer shell electrons would start moving downward through this branch. The way we would describe that as far as electrical current is by look, um, imagining positive charge carriers moving up. Because remember that when we talk electrical current, electrical current, the positive direction is defined by movement of positive charge carriers. So this is going to produce an electrical current, which is upward in the bar. And we have a complete connection here. So this electrical current will be upward in this bar, left in this region, down, and right. Now, let's talk about the magnitude of this force. Uh, QV cross B, so that's going to equal charge times the speed times the magnetic field strength times the sine of the angle between the velocity vector and these magnetic field vectors. So this velocity vector is in the plus I direction. The magnetic field vectors are in the minus K. The angle between them is 90, and the sine of 90 is 1. So this expression here uh, would give the force on a single charge carrier. Now, the current, as I've just discussed, would be counterclockwise. I'm going to go ahead and put a arrow for that current. And an important thing to realize, imagine this bar is moving at constant velocity. This current 
should therefore be constant. It would actually be an energy violation if this current kept increasing. If the velocity were constant, that would take a uh, constant force applied to this to create that. There would be a certain uh, power input into the system. If this current were increasing with time, all, at some point down the road, you'd have more energy coming out of the system than you'd have going in. This current is a constant current uh, when compared to this velocity vector. Now, if I increase this velocity vector, no doubt that would increase this current. But as long as this velocity vector is constant, this current should be constant. Now, talk a little bit here more uh, about why. The instant this bar starts moving, this force is created. And remember that electrons have a mass of approximately 10 to the minus 30th kilograms. They, they react virtually instantaneously. There, that's going to produce some sort of velocity upward that's creating this current. And that velocity is ultimately going to be some constant, which means the net force on this charge carrier must be zero. You'll notice I've got a single force vector up on it. There must be another force down. I'm going to go ahead and put that force in this picture. And then we're going to talk about the nature of it and where it's coming from. If we get a charge shift in this vertical bar, basically what that's doing is kind of like shifting positive charge upward and negative charge downward. So the bar now, in effect, has a polarity to it with the positive end of it on the top, the negative end of it on the bottom. Now, when we have a positive charge on here and a negative charge here, this will create an electric field between them. So in essence, what we have now is we have an electric field, and I think I'll use, oh, what color for that? Let's use this uh, blue here. We now have an electric field in the bar itself, which is downward, creating a electric force on this charge carrier. Now, these electrons being in equilibrium, we can say that the vector sum of all forces is equal to zero, which means this force, the magnetic force, minus the force created by this electric field, which we can write as charge times electric field strength, is equal to zero. Now you'll notice that the charge divides out of this, and we get the velocity times magnetic field minus the electric field is equal to zero. And what we have now is a relationship between the electric field, magnetic field, and the speed of that bar. Now if I put this guy on the right, we've got the electric field is equal to the velocity of the bar times the magnetic field strength. Now, this bar, or this electric field, acts all throughout this bar, vertically. This bar has a certain length. I'm going to go ahead and label that in this picture. I guess I'll call it L. And this means we now have a potential difference between the top of the bar and the bottom of the bar. Now, potential difference is basically field strength times length or field strength times distance. So I can turn this equation into a potential difference on the right just by multiplying both sides by, by L. The right-hand side, field strength times distance, now gives the potential difference between the top and bottom of this bar. And that potential difference is, depends on the length, the speed of the bar, and the magnetic field strength. So this potential difference that's created by the motion of the conductor with respect to the magnetic field this is called an induced voltage, or in this case, it would be called an induced EMF. And again, EMF is not a very well-named uh, term, but uh, it's the voltage induced in this bar by it moving through this magnetic field. All right, next we're going to uh, look at this kind of geometrically a little bit more. All right, I've defined this length L. I'm going to define this length here, X. And now, the velocity here, this blue velocity vector, 
we can relate to x. Remember that velocity is the rate that position changes. So this velocity is equal to delta x over delta t. Or in the language of calculus, um, I'm going to write this over here, we could call that dx dt. So the difference between these, delta x over delta t, would give the average velocity over a time interval. dx dt would give you the instantaneous velocity at an instant in time. But essentially, these two equations are saying the same thing. Now, in electromagnetics, an extremely important quantity to calculate is flux. If we take a look at this picture. As this bar moves to the right, there's more surface area contained here on the left by this rectangle. In this case, there's a certain magnetic flux through this rectangle. And as the bar moves to the right, that magnetic flux is increasing. Now, magnetic flux in this example would be the field strength times the area here. Now I'm going to Although I only drew these vectors here, I'm going to assume it's uniform all the way across. So an expression for the magnetic flux through this entire area would be the magnetic field strength times the area L times X. Now, if I look at this equation right here, and I kind of group these two things together, actually, whoops, not those two things, these three things together, Magnetic field times length times delta x. That is essentially giving a flux because field strength times area. Specifically, what this is giving is the change in magnetic flux as this bar moves from some x to x plus delta x. So this voltage, by kind of grouping these together and calling this top term the change in flux, this voltage is equal to the change in magnetic flux over change in time. Or in this equation here, I can kind of do the same thing. In the language of calculus, we can call this B times, oops, I'm sorry, not B. Um, think about it like this. I'm going to take this time derivative out in front of this. D dt of the quantity LxB. And Lx times B is the magnetic flux through this cross-sectional area. So we can write this as d phi dt, where again, phi is the uh, magnetic flux. So this law that's basically expressed here algebraically and here in terms of uh, derivatives and calculus, this is called Faraday's law of induction. And Faraday's law of induction basically says this. You will get a voltage any time you change a magnetic flux through some sort of closed loop here. And that voltage is equal to the rate that the magnetic flux changes. Um, so basically now what that means, this bar is effectively behaving like it's got a battery with the following potential. pushing a counterclockwise current. And the magnitude of that voltage is can be expressed as the rate that the magnetic flux changes. Right? I'm going to talk a little bit about polarity as well. When you're dealing with induced voltages, first thing you need to do is calc typically is you know understand how to calculate the magnitude of the induced voltage. And that's what these equations do for us, either in an average sense or in the language of derivatives. The next thing we need to do is learn how to describe the polarity of induced voltage. And polarity of an induced voltage is described by what's known as Lenz's Law. I'm going to get rid of some of this work so I could write Lenz's Law out. Lenz's Law is this. Nature hates a change in flux. Here's what this means. Induced voltages will always set up a current that will set up what's called an induced magnetic field that will oppose the change in flux. 
in this example, the magnetic fields are in the minus k direction. Because the bar is moving to the right, the magnetic flux is increasing. In order to oppose the change in flux, the induced current, that's this current I've drawn in my picture, would have to set up a magnetic field in the opposite direction of this original one. So the induced magnetic fields, I usually call them be induced, would have to be in the plus k, plus k direction to oppose the change in flux. Now, by the right-hand rule, imagine grabbing this wire with your right hand. In order to get a magnetic field in the plus k, you would have to grab this wire so that your thumb pointed to the right. Okay. So the purpose of this video was to uh, talk about induced voltage and introduce Faraday's law and Lenz's law. I hope that I hope that this is successfully done. That I'm going to go ahead and uh, save examples for uh, other videos. Have a great day.